Well, this morning, I want to start off with a quote, as soon as my clicker's on. The reason the world is not seeing Jesus is that Christian people are not filled with Jesus. They are satisfied with attending meetings weekly, reading the Bible occasionally, and praying sometimes. It is an awful thing for me to see people who profess to be Christians lifeless, powerless, and in a place where their lives are so parallel to unbelievers that it is difficult to tell which place they are in, whether in the flesh or in the spirit. This morning, I want to talk to you about the worldview question, why are we here? And so as a main part of my job, I work with millennials, the worst generation there ever was, right? Man, they're just awful people, young people, right? And I, and I, I, I kind of resonate with, with Smith Wigglesworth here, wrote this a long time ago, his frustration, because I, I hate to watch Christians who on a Sunday or, or with me at a Bible study, they live one way, but then throughout the week, they're a completely different person. It's, it's like they're, they're bipolar almost. And it's really frustrating to watch Christians not act like it, right? And I think if we understand what God is created us for, why he put us here on earth, I think you would start looking more and more like you're supposed to and less and less like you do. Um, and I know that's a little challenging. I'm sorry just to jump into here, but um, it doesn't get any easier from the entry point. So I just want you this morning to really, we're going to go through the, the account of Genesis this morning and the first verses of it. And I mean, a lot of people just use this as, as a defute to evolution, like see God created the world. But what I'm suggesting this morning is if we understand that there's this thing called a mago day, and it's in Latin means, that's in, in Latin, in English, it's the image of God. And when we truly understand that we were made in the image of God, I, I promise you this thing will transform the way you're living your life. I think we as Christians get this really weird Jesus box and life box, and we never mix our life together. And I'm not sure where that started from, and I'm not sure where that's at in the Bible. I secondly don't, I see Christians that, that are just live like a, just half-hearted. Like, I punched my ticket to heaven, I made it, I'm good. But then we never transform parts of our lives to say, should I really be doing that? Should, should this still be in my life? If I say I'm a Christian, should that influence still be there? And so I, want, I wanted to talk about that and, and really talking about the authoritativeness of Scripture. Church, I just, there, that we have to get back to standing in the authority of Scripture. It, it's almost as if uh, Christians are scared of the power of God. It's almost as if we're scared to say what the Bible says. Like we, we can't walk up into someone's life and be like, man, God loves you so much, he wants you in heaven. Like, that's really hard to say to somebody who's not living like it. Or homosexuality is wrong. We get afraid to just address it, right? Because it's like we're somehow afraid of the authority of it, and I don't understand that. Because everybody in here has succumbed to the authority of the word of God in your life, and has said, I need God, therefore I need saving. So why is that so hard for you to communicate to somebody else? That's what I don't understand. God made us in his image to, to, to outpour his authoritativeness in this world. And, and guys, I think we're losing it. I think we're losing this fight. And we have to come back to standing firmly in what the Bible says. And so I'm gonna go over these opening verses in Genesis. We're gonna be in Genesis 1, 26 and 28, and then we're gonna go to Genesis 2, a lot of it is the same information, but I'm just going to read through this. It says, then God said, let us, three people, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, make humankind. It didn't say mankind. It didn't say white people. It said humankind. Humankind was made black, white, yellow, red, brown. Humankind was made. Mankind, we are all a portion of Adam, described from that through generations. There isn't just a man ahead of a woman. Mankind is the reflection of Jesus Christ, and that's what we're going to see. And it's in our image, according to our likeness. We are made to reflect who God is. 
and let them have dominion. The word dominion in Hebrew there actually means rule, like ruler, like king. We are supposed to be ruling in our culture. We're supposed to be reigning in our culture because our God is the king who is once and for all and we represent him. We're not the one worshiped, he is. We're just here to be a mirror for everyone to see him through us. And so are you understanding that authority, that dominion over everything, the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air and over the cattle and all over the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image in the Imago Dei, image of God. He created them two genders, male and female, There isn't multiple, there isn't an option here. And if you need to learn how to tell the difference, go back to science class. Male and female, there's not multiple. I don't care what your feelings tell you. He created them. God blessed them and God said to them, two imperatives, be fruitful and multiply. Get out. Quit acting like church is the building and be the church. Be fruitful and multiply. But secondly, fill the earth and subdue it. Again, that word subdue is the same as dominion. Rule in it and have dominion. Over again, everything, the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. When God made creation, I picture him just looking down at everything he created. He's looking at trees, he's looking at rocks, he's looking at flowers, and he's like, man, this looks good. He just calls everything good, right? He's like, it's good. I did this, gay. Right, like, it's good. But then he pops up this humankind, and he goes, oh, that's very good. It's the first time he says it. That's very good. So what I'm gonna do is instead of, of putting my presence in a tree or a rock is creation proclaims who God is, right? We love to think as Christians, we, we, all we got to do is worship, right? I never really understood that because God worked in the account of creation. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all of their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all of the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because on it, God rested from all of the work that he had done in creation. We get this idea that we're saved and we don't have to do anything to keep our faith up. Why, why if God had to work, don't we? There's a thing called sanctification. There's a thing calling that you should be progressing in your life. If we're understanding the breath of God that he did into us, there should be a change in you there, there shouldn't, you shouldn't be the same person you were when you accepted Jesus Christ. That day you got saved should be drastically different than 30 years down the road. That, that should happen. The problem is we, we, we split off in life and we're gonna address that. Continuing on, it says, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. And the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, verse five and six are so interesting to me. I bet you never noticed in the account of creation, God never allowed anything to grow until he put humans in it. God allowed nothing to be on the earth until he put humankind in it. Verse five says, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth and no herb of the field had yet sprung up. Why? One, because the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth. But two, there was no one to take care of it. There is no one to till the ground. And then verse six is one of my questions I'm asking God when I get to heaven. Why did you make mud at creation? But a stream would rise up from the earth and water the whole face of the ground. Why? You just told me there's no plants there. Why are you making mud? There has to be a reason. I just don't know it. Then the Lord God, then the Lord God, formed the dust of the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. In Hebrew, living being means nephesh. Nephesh is what separates humankind from everything else. You have plants, you have trees, you have animals. I'm sorry, your dog's probably not in heaven. I'm sorry. We're separated. 
as humankind. It's like, have you ever been, had a little kid and he grabbed your face to get you to pay attention? I picture God like making Adam one from dust, which I can't really picture. But then like he just reaches down and like grabs him like a little baby. And he's just like, and Adam comes to life at that minute. At that minute, he now has inherited the breath. That word there is literal soul. The breath of a living God who his main purpose is to take care of what God called was good. And so what I see in this count of creation is, man, that's your purpose. You no longer have to worry about what's my career. There's so much. Millennials have no idea what they're doing in life. That's probably my number one talk I have with every kid. I don't know what I want to do. I didn't either. I didn't figure it out until I was like 29, I think. Like, I have no idea. We're all just figuring this out together, man. Right? And so, like, they have no idea of a purpose. And when I learned this account of creation, when I learned the image of God that breathed into me, all of a sudden, my purpose becomes, I'm cultivating my environment. I should be working in it, right? If I say I love Jesus Christ, I should be cultivating it. I should be, have authority in it. If God made me to represent a king, I should have that kingship. And thirdly, I should be reflecting him. People should see him through me. Right? That's the purpose of the Christian life. Like, we, we get this weird idea that because we came to church and then, like, we trickle out, like, we all mass come into a building and trickle out the door, right? We need to flip that and say, man, we need to trickle in the door and pour out to the world. Because I feel like a lot of times sermons are addressed at Christians, not the lost. And I said in one of my last sermons, don't bring me people to get saved. That's your job. I'm supposed to be proclaiming truth to you. You're supposed to be representing God. So are we doing that? And so to finish this, um, in the east, and then in verse eight, and the Lord God planted a garden in Eden. In the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground, the Lord God now made everything, trees that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Verse 10 says, a river flows now out of the garden and from there it divides into four branches. I'm skipping those four because it just tells you the names of the rivers. 15 says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till and to keep it. This idea of the image of God is really formed in Genesis 2, 7. It says, the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a nephish. What you have to understand about this is the symbolism of temple worship and our world as God's good creation. Temple worship, okay, you guys know the Tower of Babel story, Genesis 11? More than likely, that was called a ziggurat when they built it. All right, it's just a big structure with stairs on the outside of it. And it was meant for multiple gods that they believed in that day to come down the tower to visit the people. Right? It was just a way to get to God. It was a way for those people to say, I don't want to be fruitful, multiply. I want to sit here and get me praised. Do they actually say that in Genesis 11? I want my name worshiped. Okay? And in the top of that tower was a statue. And there's a lot of theologians that suggest that the God of Enki was at the top of the tower. This God was at the bottom of Mesopotamia. And it was said that Enki took the salty waters of the rivers Mesopotamia means in between two rivers, and then made it living water. And I think it's so profound that Jesus refers to us as the salt and he's the living water. Even when we stand in our rebellion and we go, God, I want me to be worshiped. He goes, yeah, you know what? There, there's still people that need to see me through you. And I don't care what you're gonna try to do in your own effort, what you're gonna try to portray. I'm gonna use the ironicness of your God to proclaim who I am, the one true God that should be visiting you, not this fake one. And so they would always put at the temple what was to be worshiped. And what God did is he made this awesome garden. He made this awesome place, peaceful, no bloodlust. If you read the account of Genesis, we're all supposed to be vegetarians. That would be horrible. It's the only thing I'm thankful about. I get to have steak. Like I would off, oh, I'd hate that. But we weren't supposed to have like a bloodlust. That's murder, that's violence. I love me a good steak though, man. 
The only time a woman decided what to eat ruined everything. <laughs> I'll tell you. So, sorry, that was a cheap shot. So, when we understand this image of God, I think it denotes three things in our life. Imago Dei in Latin just means image of God. But number two, it denotes humankind as the centerpiece of God's creation. God put humankind, he put you in the centerpiece of this creation to say, hey, here I am. This is me. This is what I can do. This is the grace I offer. This is the love I show. And he said, man, I love that. It's not a tree. It's not a rock. These people get weird theologies out there like they're, they're worshiping a tree. Man, let me know how that works out for you. Gosh, that's got to be weird. So I just want you to really hear. I just look, I see God looking at you and he's like, man, there I am. If you believe in who Jesus Christ is, you're that. You're the centerpiece of creation. And thirdly, I don't know if you realize this, but you carry the living presence of God and it's by God's design. There is no other worldview in this whole earth that puts humanity at the center of it. Everything else is praise me, praise me, praise me. Come do for me. God says, I'm here for you. I'm serving you. I died for you so you can live in me. God flips that and says, you guys, reflect me. So my professor summarizes this image of God like this. When the human race was commissioned to fill the earth in order to rule it, this biological imperative implied more than simple reproduction. Of course, in order to rule the earth, humanity had to multiply. The human calling to be the image of God in God's cosmic temple involved also filling the earth with the divine presence. The human purpose, listen to this, was to mediate God's holy presence from heaven to earth. You want a purpose, there it is. Precisely through faithful cultural development of the earth as the human race continued to multiply and increase. But sin got in the way of that sacred calling. That's how we mess this all up. Everyone wants to say that the devil is running rampant in this world. This is my suggestion. If you were living in the image of God, you wouldn't be supporting that. You only can live two different ways. You're either supporting the devil or you live with God. There isn't a middle ground there. And so what this explains is human creation and humankind was good. At some point, all of this was okay. But then we want our own name, our own image, our own purpose to fulfill the earth and thus violence happened. Cain killed Abel. Things just got out of control. Death is now a thing. All of these things now are messed up. And the question is, what's in you? Are we part of the problem or are we helping the problem? Because as humankind, we were, our purpose was to help the problem. Humans filled with earth, not just with their offspring, but also with their violence, thus corrupting the earth. And so the developmental historical process of the transformation of the world into a fit place for God's habitation has never been completed. We know it will be. It just hasn't been yet, right? We're still living in a world that's completely fallen, completely messed up, completely damaged, right? Our creation, what God's good creation is now just complete garbage. But one day he restores that. And so what I want to look at is I've said them several times already, but in this account of creation, in this, why are we here? I see three different things. We're supposed to cultivate, we're supposed to be reigning, and we're supposed to be reflecting. And so when I look at cultivate, it comes out of Genesis 2.15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. Now, you, you know this literally. If you're a farmer, we literally till the ground, right? Like you planted grass outside your house, now you have grass, right? We cultivate as God. We have to trim a rose bush. If you have rose bushes in your yard, you know that you have a relation to the earth to take care of it. Now, I'm not a hippie, I'm bald, so I can't be a hippie. But I would suggest this. I think we're doing a really bad job. All right, I'm just suggesting that. I drive a hybrid, not because I'm earth conscious. It was a price I could afford. 
You know what I mean? Like I look like this hippie guy right now, but I'm really not. I litter daily. Does that help you think of me better? Um, but you, you have to understand that we are to be taking care. We are stewards of where we're living. That was one of our purposes. But I think we should do this figuratively too. So I'm preparing for my sermon and my wife comes in from weeding our garden. She's like, I'm working up a sermon out there, babe. And I'm like, what? She goes, I had to weed the garden. I was like, yeah, mm-hmm. And she goes, if I didn't weed it, because we're leaving for vacation for two weeks, and when I come back, all those weeds are going to overflow the garden, and it's going to take out the good fruit that could be there. So what we have to do is you have to pluck those weeds out, and I know they're going to come back. And she's like, well, that's where the analogy breaks down. I'm like, no, not necessarily. Because the same water that waters the good stuff also waters the bad, right? Water's not selective. So as you grow and cultivate in your life, those bad things that grow, if we keep pulling them, you'll notice they don't get as strong. And you'll notice that the good fruit keeps growing because that's what you're focusing on. You're cultivating what should be happening in your life as the purpose of being in the image of God. You should be cultivating something good in your life. I don't understand why we have to be a missionary to be nice in our neighborhood. It's the calling of every Christian to just be a good person. And so why do I have to go to, well, I mean, I'm picking on myself, but why do I have to go to the Philippines to feel like I, I need to serve God? We should be cultivating our neighborhoods. We should be reaching the people that don't know God around us, opening our home, creating a small little community in that neighborhood. Like it's just, what we should do. And I promise you, I'm like the only person in my neighborhood, I mean, on my street, I'll say, that has any idea what church is. And I love my neighbors. Oh, man, I love my neighbor. I can't tell his name because I'm being on Facebook right now and he can see it. He's a great guy. He has no idea who God is. He's an awesome dude. <laughs> First time I met him, he's like, hi, I'm, I have a DUI. I can't drive till February. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I'm Josh. Like, why are you telling me this, man? This is a little soon. He has no idea. I love him. He's great. But I'm not tooting my own horn because we really don't have that great of a relationship. But it's just, are you cultivating in your environment? Are you doing the work God has asked you to do in your life? Because, man, that image of God is in you. It was there from creation. So are we taking care of it? Does that make sense? And so I, I say this to say in our, in our environment, we, we should be also reigning in it. We should have authority. That word dominion from the front, we should have some sort of authority. In, our, in 2 Corinthians 5.20, it says this, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. Through you. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. That word ambassador is presbyo. And that's in Greek because we're in the New Testament now. Someone who is knowledgeable, especially of where they belong. I never understood the whole king, Jesus is king, we're royalty and prince. I, that never landed with me. Like I was never excited when someone told me I was the son of a king. Like I just never, I, I don't live in England, so I don't get it. I just, I never got it. Until I learned what Hebrew kings were. And then it just clicked to me. When you looked at Hebrew kings, King David was one. King Solomon was one. Nebuchadnezzar was a king. They were viewed as deity. That's why they had temples and huge palaces and gold. That's why they had all this stuff, because all the people would say, you're superhuman. And good kings in the Bible, David, Solomon, would say, no, I'm not it. God is it. God's the king. I see him and do what he wants me to do in this earth. I don't reign, God does. Bad kings like Nebuchadnezzar go, yeah, you should probably worship me. Three people out of an entire city thought that was a bad idea. If it was happening then, we've, it's happening today and there's gotta be a thing of we're losing the authority of scripture. There were only three people that stood up and said that isn't right. Everyone else was like, I don't wanna die. Mm-mm. So if it happened way back then, how much worse is it in the church today? Are we understanding that, man, we should never 
ever be ashamed of the authority of Scripture. We should never back down from the Bible that saved us to say, this is right. God actually loves you. And if you want to know how, look at my life. Follow what I'm doing. Because if you're doing this, God through you is making an appeal to be reconciled to God. That to me is true Christianity. You're representing God well enough that people look at you and go, what do you have? I need it. Are we giving that appeal through us? I wrote this. It said, if we as Christians don't start proactively demonstrate and clearly state the authoritativeness of scripture, we will lose our influence once and for all. We need to firmly plant ourselves in the word of God and live according to its moral standard. Church, wake up. It is time to proclaim what God says in his word and to actually do it. This isn't a time to be wishy-washy on stances of gender and homosexuality and marriage and life. This isn't the time. This isn't the time to be half in and half out. Because I promise you, we will lose if we lose the authority of Scripture. Relativism will shut down the church. Because all of a sudden, it washes out all truth of Scripture. If we don't wake up, and the only way you can really demonstrate the authoritativeness of Scripture is if you know it. This isn't a plea, but Pastor Bill puts his Bible on his head all the time. What's in here has to be in here, right? So church, we have to have the authoritativeness of Scripture to be able to cultivate our culture well. And then lastly, we need to be reflecting in God's world. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness that we get this really bad theology that I have a Jesus box and I have my life box. We get this really bad theology that says that I pray, I went to church, and I read my Bible today, but then I have to go to Walmart, I have to walk my dog, I have to clean my house, I have to go to work, I ate a burrito, and these things don't matter to God. There's a sacred side to God, and there's a secular side to my life. That couldn't be farther from the truth. If you say you're a Christian, your entire worldview is holding the image of God to say all of you should be pointed at Jesus Christ. And I don't know where we started getting this idea that I can love Jesus and drink a little too. That shirt, I would love to light it on fire. Do you love Jesus or do you love alcohol? Because you're basically making both stances right there. Which one do you want? I don't get it. Because you're robbing your purpose of what God's created you do to point everything to him so others can be pointed to him too. But instead we cheapen it with what we want because it feels good at the minute. Or I'm afraid to offend you. Come on. Really? Seriously? Where'd our backbone go? I don't understand. I, I get it. It's not, you're not going to be liked. And I'm not telling you to go out there and berate every human out there. Please don't. You'll get punched in the face. I promise you'll lose. I promise it. But if your life can go, man, let me just show you what God did to me. What can, let me show you how God's living through me. Because, you know, like in churches, we get these weird analogies, right? Like, like the cross has to be right there like that screw was ordained to be in the wall right there? Or, you know, like, I know that, I know that doesn't happen here. I, I preach at other churches and they deal with this stuff like carpet color. Like that matters. A chair color, songs we sing, what time church ends, how often you come. These things don't matter. But we act like they do. We act like because... The floor's now gray that the building's going to cave in. Man made this building. It's a man-made thing. Without God's presence in it, we're dead in the water. So why do we think the building is something to be housed with God? Like it's a sacred place. So on Facebook, I'm in this really weird Facebook group, and they're like, show me a picture of your sacred places. And I wanted to take a selfie. <laughs> so I'm like, it's me. I'm it. 
Like you walk up to Jesus and be like, how's your spiritual life? Jesus would be like, what? Who? What? My what? It's me. I'm good. How are you? Because there isn't a spiritual life. There isn't a sector life. It's your life in Christ. It's all of you reflecting and representing and reigning in our culture to change the world for his love and grace. It has nothing to do with your profession. It has everything to do with Jesus Christ in you. And are you representing him well? Are we understanding our purpose or are we just going to lay down? and go? Oh, well, you believe that. No, I don't believe that. You shouldn't either. Come on. I think if we can really embrace this image of God thing, I think we could change our communities. We'd be changing workplaces. Man, I believe everybody needs to love Jesus Christ. I really hope you do. As the band comes up, I'm going to read you this quote from C.S. Lewis. It says, There is no ordinary people. You have never met a mere mortal. The people you see every day, even the ones whom you give little regard, will live forever. That's an imperative. They will live forever. Either under salvation or under judgment. Even the most obscure person is not ordinary in God's eyes. Church, we need to wake up. We need to wake up. The authoritativeness of Scripture needs to be firmly planted in us. We need to be cultivating our environment, our neighborhoods, our church, our everything. And we need to be rightly reflecting who God is to everyone around us. Amen? Let me pray. God, I I thank you for the truth of your word and how you created us. Father, that you put us as the centerpiece of your creation. That, Lord, you, you looked on humankind and said, I want them to have the ability to change an environment. I want that to be what's a representation of me. And Father, if there's anything in us that's, that's not allowing that to happen, that God, maybe we have just this, this weird addiction or God, we have this, this situation in our lives that said, I, I can't possibly live for God because I'm doing this. Father, I pray that you erode that in us and God, that you would propel us past it to rightly represent the image of God in today's world. Father, thank you for our purpose and thank you for your plan. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.